IB Biology, Ecology, and Conservation, Option C, Part 2, continues our study of community ecology. Community ecology examines groups of populations living and interacting in a common habitat. This movie will have its focus on animal-plant interaction, known as herbivory, as well as predator-prey interaction, and symbioses, specifically mutualism and parasitism. The essential idea is community structure is an emergent property of an ecosystem. Here is the outline for all of the ecology conservation option C movies in this unit. Use this outline to find the part you need. This movie has its focus right here. Here are the first two IB syllabus statements to start the movie, both of which I introduced in part one. Each species plays a unique role within a community because of the unique combinations of its spatial habitat and interactions with other species. Interactions between species in a community can be classified according to their effect. Here is the outline of species interactions within community ecology. Part one looked at competition, and part two, this movie, is looking at predator-prey, including herbivory, as well as symbioses and keystone species. Here is a photograph of herbivory, an animal ingesting plant material. This is the Galapagos tortoise, Chelanoides nigra. Here are additional photographs of herbivory, photographs that display the impact of insect herbivory on plants. You need to be able to describe local examples to illustrate the range of ways in which species can interact within a community. Here is another photograph of herbivory, animals ingesting plant material. Herbivory has a significant impact on plants, and the evidence can be seen in this graph that shows the number of seeds produced by plants when voles, a local herbivore, were present in the system or excluded from experimental quadrats. The experiment on the left side of this graph looked at plants favored by voles, and you can see that plants fare far better when voles are excluded. The experiment on the right looked at the impact of voles on plants not typically eaten by voles. For plants not favored by voles, there's really no significant difference in the number of seeds produced, whether voles are excluded or not excluded. Here is similar evidence to demonstrate the strong impact of herbivory on plants, looking at plant height. For plants preferred by voles, you can see that the height of plants is significantly greater when voles are excluded than when they are present. Interestingly enough, when voles are present, other plants fare better because voles are feeding on the preferred plants, giving these plants that are not preferred by voles an advantage. So now let's move on to predator-prey relationships. In these photographs, we can see some classic examples of predator-prey relationships. Keep in mind that the predator has an impact on the size of the prey population and the availability of prey for the predator influences the size of the predator population. The presence of one species is important in holding the population of the other species around carrying capacity. Here is a leopard preying on an antelope. The presence of one species is important in holding the population of the other species around carrying capacity. Remember, the predator has an impact on the size of the prey population, and the availability of prey for the predator influences the size of the predator population. Now here, in this slide, we have other predator-prey images, and it's important for you to think about all possible predator-prey relationships beyond the obvious. For example, consider the snake preying on a frog, an insect preying on another insect, or a spider capturing insects in its web. This graph displays a generalized relationship of predator-prey interaction in terms of numbers in the population, numbers over time. You can see the oscillation of each population in a steady-state equilibrium around their respective carrying capacities. 
The oscillations seen here are evidence of negative feedback, and predator-prey interactions are good examples of the mechanism of negative feedback. As the numbers of prey in green increase, the numbers of predators in gray increase. But notice the slight time lag. The predator numbers increase after the prey numbers increase. It takes time for the predator to feed and then translate the food into more offspring. This is a biological time lag seen in all predator-prey relationships. Then the increasing numbers of predators cause the prey numbers to fall. Once the prey numbers decline, predator numbers decline. And then as the predator numbers decline, prey numbers will increase. And then predator numbers follow, always with a time lag. Here is a graphical representation, a model of a predator-prey interaction. The predator is the paramecium and the prey is the yeast. Both populations display typical J-shaped exponential growth early in time when resources are unlimited. Positive feedback, exponential growth early with unlimited resources. But within a few days, the negative feedback mechanism, typical of predator-prey relationships, begins to play a role. The prey population increases, the predator population also increases with a slight time lag. Then, with increasing number of predators, the prey population decreases. Then, the predator population decreases. Then, the prey numbers increase. Then, the predator numbers increase, etc. Each population oscillates around its respective carrying capacity. Here is predator prey data from the Hudson Bay Trading Company in Canada, displaying the number of lynx and hare pelts purchased over a period of time, a long period of time. The first thing to notice is the steady state oscillation of each population, presumably around a carrying capacity. The original graph was color-coded so the reader could distinguish the predator lynx from the prey, the hare. But can you distinguish which curve belongs to which species? The curve with the regularly larger numbers would be the hare, the prey. If you're not sure why, think back to numbers pyramids, which typically have larger numbers of primary consumers supporting smaller numbers of secondary consumers. This curve represents the hare, and this one represents the lynx. Notice the slight time lag between the initial increase in the population of the hare followed by the increase in the population of the lynx. The regularity of the oscillations in combination with the long period of time over which the data was collected make the data presented here very compelling as data supporting the predator-prey relationship. But if you're thinking carefully about this data, you should feel some skepticism. The Hudson Bay Trading Co Company bought and sold pelts, the skins of dead animals brought to them by hunters. The numbers represented here are not numbers of living animals in the wild collected by scientists. The data comes from hunters who killed the animals by the thousands, thus influencing the size of the very populations we imagine we're studying when we examine data such as this. Are the number of pelts brought to the Hudson Bay Trading Company an accurate yet indirect sample of the numbers of animals present in the wild? Maybe, but this data is a fine place for you to exercise some skepticism or at least some careful thinking. Here's a look at our last predator-prey interaction. Two populations interacting to maintain each population around carrying capacity through negative feedback mechanisms. I like this graph because the graph distinguishes the numbers of the two species on separate axes. The prey, Eotranicus, is along this y-axis, and the predator, Typhlodromus, is along this y-axis. This is appropriate, as the number of individuals in the ecosystem will be quite different for each species, so to place their respective numbers on the same y-axis would be misleading. As Eotranicus increase, Typhlodromus increase. As Eotranicus decrease, Typhlodromus decrease with a time lag. 
So we've been hovering around this IB syllabus statement. Describe local examples to illustrate the range of ways in which species can interact within a community. Let's continue. Here is the outline of the range of ways in which species can interact within a community. Now we will look at symbioses. You can see that I've provided a shorthand notation for each relationship. Mutualism is a plus-plus, where each species benefits from the interaction. Parasitism and disease, by the way, are plus-minus, where one species benefits and one species is weakened or harmed. Commensalism is a plus-zero, where one species benefits but the other is not helped or harmed by the interaction. I won't spend much time on commensalism. Mutualism is defined as a relationship between individuals of two or more species in which all benefit and none suffer. In these photographs, you can see cleaner shrimp cleaning, picking the parasites off the skin and teeth of these moray eels. The shrimp receive food while the eels are cleaned of parasites and cleaned of potentially disease-causing organisms. The clownfish and the anemone have a mutualistic relationship. The clownfish will ward off other fish that might do harm to the anemone, and the clownfish is protected from predators by the anemone that has stinging cells in its tentacles. The crocodile gets parasites removed from its mouth by the bird, and the bird receives food. Both species gain from the interaction. Corals are a symbiotic relationship between animals that build reefs and the zooxanthellae, algae. In other words, photosynthetic algae are symbiotic with coral animals. Corals are found in tropical regions near the equator. Equatorial regions experience high light and warm temperatures. As a result, corals have high photosynthetic productivity. How is that possible? Corals are a good example of a mutualistic symbiotic relationship between photosynthetic algae and the coral animal. Zooxanthellae algae lives within the tissues of the reef-building corals. This is mutualism. It's a symbiosis. The bee receives food as pollen and in turn distributes the pollen to other plants as part of the fertilization process in plant sexual reproduction. This is mutualism. These birds, oxpeckers, pick off ticks and other parasites, receiving nutrition in the process. The antelope benefits from having less parasitism, less disease. Here's an interesting example of biotic interactions, but be careful here. I'm not sure how these interactions would be classified. We have leafcutter ants that harvest plant material. This is herbivory. And take the leaves back to the nest, where they chew the leaves with saliva and provide the mash to a fungus that grows within the nest. The ants don't eat the leaves. The ants eat the fungus. The fungus would not survive without the ants, even though the ants eat the fungus. Parasitism is the second symbiotic interaction among populations within a community. Parasitism is a plus-minus relationship where one species gains at the expense of another. In this image, we can see examples of parasites that have infected a host organism. We can see a tick budding into the skin. The tick itself withdraws blood, and the tick serves as a vector in transmitting other disease-causing organisms. The trypanosome parasite causes sleeping sickness. Leeches withdraw blood from their host. Tapeworms infect the guts of mammals taking food from the host, and guinea worms Similarly, take nutrients from the host they infect. The cuckoo bird lays its egg into the nest of a different species, the mother of which raises the cuckoo chick. This is parasitism. Fungus, seen here at the edges of these leaves, can be parasitic on plants. Mistletoe is a parasitic plant that infects other plants by boring into the sap and extracting nutrients. Daughter is another parasitic plant that infects other plants, extracting nutritive saps of the other plants. Here is a definition of parasitism. It's a relationship between two species in which one species lives in or on another, gaining all or much of its food from it. A disease would be defined similarly. 
It's one species, the pathogen, that lives in or on another, the host, gaining all or much of its food from the host. The last symbiotic interaction, an interaction on which I will not elaborate, is commensalism. It's a plus zero relationship where one species gains from the presence of the other, but the second species is neither harmed nor helped. In this photograph, the egrets easily find food as the cow moves through the environment, kicking up insects. In this example, the cow gains nothing from the relationship. And that brings our analysis of symbiotic relationships to an end. And now we're on to examine the unique roles of certain species, species known as keystone species. Keystone species are species whose role is vital to the survival of other species in an ecosystem. Keystone species maintain a high diversity, higher diversity, than the system would have without the keystone species. In other words, without the keystone species, other species in the ecosystem are likely to disappear, and the ecosystem is less diverse. Now, I've provided you photographs here of arches that have a keystone in the center of the arch. The keystone, by virtue of its shape and position, is critical to the integrity of the arch. Without the keystone, the arch falls apart. Without the keystone species in a community, the ecosystem holds together less well, is less diverse. The first example of a keystone species is the sea otter. The sea otter eats urchins, and the urchins eat kelp, the producer in the system. In ecosystems where the otter has been removed, the urchins bloom and consume all the kelp. The ecosystem collapses. Pizaster, a starfish, is a keystone species. Pizaster feeds on mussels, and without Pizaster, the mussels bloom, reducing the algae. Without algae as a producer in the ecosystem, the ecosystem collapses. Now consider ecological engineers as keystone species. For example, prairie dogs. Prairie dog burrows provide nesting areas for birds, plovers, and owls. Tunnel systems channel rainwater that prevents runoff and erosion and can also serve to change the composition of the soil by increasing aeration, which is good for decomposers. Without the prairie dog as a keystone ecological engineer, the system is not as diverse. The grizzly bear is an ecological engineer because grizzly bears transfer nutrients from the aquatic ecosystem to the forest ecosystem. Salmon are rich in nitrogen, sulfur, carbon, phosphorus, they swim up rivers from the ocean. Bears capture the salmon and disperse nutrient-rich feces and partially eaten carcasses to the land. African elephants are ecological engineers because they uproot trees, making room for the grass species that support the grazing herbivores. How might the ecosystem change without the elephant? Beavers are ecological engineers because they transform a stream into a pond, transforming the entire ecosystem with species that can only be supported by the still water of a pond. In a community, different species play different but uniquely important roles. For example, the tiger is a large animal requiring many, many square kilometers of territory. Because of its demand for large tracts of unspoiled habitat, many other species will also survive, if the tiger survives. The tiger might be called an umbrella species. And let's not forget the unique role of decomposers in the ecosystem. Decomposers break large organic molecules of dead organisms into smaller inorganic molecules. Without decomposers, it's said that the world would be littered with the carcasses of every organism that had ever lived and died. And that brings us to the end of IB Bio Ecology and Conservation Option C Part 2.